one of the the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... Ooh, yeah. That's too painful. I would like to, uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that, that, uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell to Louise Cowell on November the 24th, 1946 at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. After eight years at the home, Louise returned to her parents' house in Philadelphia to raise her new son. For the first several years of his life, Ted thought his grandparents were his parents and his mother was his sister. In 1951, Louise and Ted moved to Tacoma, Washington, and Louise married Johnny Bundy, who was a military cook. Despite his parental circumstances and his limited surroundings, Bundy was well behaved and grew into an attractive teen who was generally liked and performed well in school. After high school, he entered the University of Puget Sound and continued to do well academically, but felt uncomfortable around his fellow peers, who were very wealthy. In his sophomore year, Bundy transferred to the University of Washington to escape the uncomfortable feeling of his financial inadequacy. Throughout his years at high school, Bundy suffered from acute shyness that resulted in him as appearing socially awkward. This affliction followed him into college, and although Bundy had friends, he never blended comfortably into doing much social activities others were doing. He rarely dated and kept himself to himself, but in 1967, Bundy met the woman of his dreams. She was pretty, wealthy, and sophisticated. They both shared a skill and passion for skiing, and spent many weekends on the ski slopes. Ted fell in love with his new girlfriend and tried hard to impress her to the point of grossly exaggerating his own accomplishments. He tried to gain her approval with a summer scholarship to Stanford that he won, although his time there was less than impressive. By 1968, she decided that Bundy lacked any real future and was not husband material. She ended the relationship and broke Bundy's heart, and his obsessions towards her haunted him for years. Bundy suffered from extreme depression over the breakup and dropped out of school. It was during this time that he learned the truth that his sister was his mother and his parents were his grandparents. Bundy was also getting a whisper reputation by those who were close to him for being a petty theft. It was during this phase of his life that his shyness was replaced by a false bravado and he returned in college, excelled as major and earned a bachelor's degree in psychology. Bundy became involved with another woman, Elizabeth Kendall, who wrote the book, The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy, who was a divorcee with a young daughter. She fell deeply in love with Bundy, and despite her suspicions that Bundy was seeing another woman, her devotions towards him continued. Bundy was not receptive about the idea of marriage, but allowed the relationship to continue, even after reuniting with his first love, who was attracted to the new confidant, Ted Bundy. Bundy worked on the re-election campaign of Washington's Republican governor, Dan Evans. Evans was elected and he appointed Bundy to the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. Bundy's political future seemed secure, when in 1973, he became assistant to Ross Davis, who was the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. It was a good time in Bundy's life. He had a girlfriend, his old girlfriend was once again in love with him, and his footing in the political arena was strong. In 1974, young women began vanishing from the college campus around Washington and Oregon. Linda Ann Healy, a 21-year-old radio announcer, was among those who were missing. On July 1974, two women were approached at a Seattle State Park by an attractive man who introduced himself as Ted. He asked them to help them with a sailboat, but they refused. Later that day, two other women were seen going off with him and were never seen alive again. 
In the fall of 1974, Bundy enrolled in a law school at the University of Utah and moved to Salt Lake City. In November, Carol Deronch was attacked at a Utah mall by a man dressed up as a police officer, but she managed to escape. She provided the police with a description of the man, the VW he was driving, and a sample of his blood that got on a jacket during their struggle. Within a few hours after Deronch was attacked, 17-year-old Debbie Kent disappeared. Around this time, hikers discovered a graveyard of bones in Washington Forest, later identified as belonging to the missing women found both from Washington and Utah. Investigators from both states communicated and came up with a profile and a composite sketch of the man named Ted, who approached women for help, sometimes appearing helpless with a cast on his arm or crutches. They also had the description of his tan, VW, and his blood type, which was type O. Authorities compared the similarities of the women disappearing. They were all white, thin, and single, and had long hair that was parted in the middle. They also vanished during the evening hours. The bodies of the dead women found in Utah had all been hit with a blunt object to the head, raped and sodomized. Authorities knew they were dealing with a serial killer who had the capability to travel from state to state. On January the 12th, 1975, Karen Campbell, vanished from a ski resort in Colorado whilst on vacation with her fiancé and his two children. A month later, Karen's nude body was found lying in short distance from the road. An examination of her remains determined that she'd received violent blows to her skull. Over the next few months, five more women were found dead in Colorado with similar blows to the head, possibly a result of being hit with a crowbar. In August 1975, police attempted to stop Bundy for a driving violation. He aroused suspicion when he tried to get away by turning his lights off and speeding through stop signs. When he was finally stopped in his Volkswagen and was searched, police found handcuffs, an ice pick, a crowbar, and pantyhose with eye holes cut out along with other questionable items. They also saw that the front seat on the passenger side of his car was missing, but police arrested Ted Bundy on suspicion of burglary. Police compared the things found in Bundy's car to those Deronch described seeing in the attacker's car. The handcuffs that had been placed around one of her wrists were the same make as those in Bundy's possession. Once Deronch picked Bundy out of the lineup, the police felt that they had enough evidence to charge him with attempted kidnapping. The authorities also felt confident that they had the person responsible for the tree state murder spree that has gone on for more than a year. Bundy went to trial for attempted kidnapping of Deronch in February 1976, and after waiving his right to a jury trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. During this time, police were investigating the links to Bundy and the Colorado murders. According to his credit card statements, he was in the area where several women vanished in early 1975. In October 1976, Bundy was charged with the murder of Karen Campbell. Bundy was extradited from Utah prison to Colorado for the trial but serving as his own lawyer allowed him to appear in court without leg irons, which gave him an opportunity to move freely from the courtroom to the law library inside the courthouse. In an interview, while in the role as his own attorney, Bundy said, more than ever, I am convinced of my own innocence. In June 1977, during a pre-trial hearing, he escaped by jumping out of the law library window. He was captured a week later. On December the 30th, 1977, Bundy escaped prison and made his way to Tallahassee, Florida, where he rented an apartment near Florida State University under the name of Chris Hagen. College life was something Bundy was familiar with and one he enjoyed. He managed to buy food and pay his way at a local college bars with stolen credit cards. When he was bored, he would duck into lecture halls and listen to the speakers. It was just a matter of time before the evil monster inside Bundy would resurface. On Saturday, January the 14th, 1978, Bundy broke into Florida State University's Chi Omega sorority house and beat and strangled to death two women, raping one of them and brutally biting her on her buttocks and one nipple. He beat two others over the head with a log. They survived which investigators attributed to their roommate Nita Neary, who came home and interrupted Bundy before he was able to kill the other two victims. Nita Neary came home around 3 a.m and noticed that the front door of the house was slightly open. As she entered, she heard hurried footsteps above going towards the stairways. 
She hid in a doorway and watched as a man wearing a blue cap and carrying a log as he left the house. Upstairs, she found her roommates. Two were dead and the other two were severely wounded. That same night, another woman was attacked and the police found a mask on her floor, identical to the one found later in Bundy's car. On February the 9th, 1978, Bundy killed again. This time, it was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who he kidnapped and then mutilated. Within a week of the disappearance of Kimberly, Bundy was arrested in Pensacola for driving a stolen vehicle. Investigators had eyewitnesses who identified Bundy at the dorm at Kimberly School. They also had physical evidence that linked him to the three murders, including a mold of the bite marks found on the flesh of the sorority house victims. Bundy was still thinking he could beat a guilty verdict, but turned down a plea bargain, whereby he would plead guilty to killing the two sorority women and Kimberly in exchange for three 25-year sentences. Bundy went on trial in Florida on June the 25th, 1979, for the murders of the sorority women. The trial was televised, and Bundy played up to the media when on occasion he acted as his own attorney. Bundy was found guilty on both murder charges and given two death sentences by means of the electric chair. On January the 7th, 1980, Bundy went on trial for killing Kimberly Leach. This time, he allowed his attorneys to represent him. They decided on an insanity plea, the only defense possible with the amount of evidence that the state had against him. Bundy's behavior was much different during this trial than the previous one. He displayed fits of anger, slouched in his chair, and his collegiate look was sometimes replaced with a haunting glare. Bundy was found guilty and received a third death sentence. Bundy surprised everyone by calling Carol Boone as a character witness and marrying her while she was on the witness stand. Boone was convinced of Bundy's innocence. She later gave birth to Bundy's child, a little girl who Bundy adored. In time, Boone divorced Bundy after realizing he was guilty of the horrific crimes. After endless appeals, Bundy's last day of execution was on January the 17th, 1989. Before being put to death, Bundy gave the details of more than 50 women he had murdered to Washington State Attorney's General, Chief Investigator, Dr. Bob Keppel. He also confessed to keeping the heads of some of his victims at his home, plus engaging in necrophilia with some of his victims. In his final interview, he blamed his exposure to pornography at an impressionable age, being the stimulant behind his murderous obsessions. Many directly involved with Bundy believed he murdered at least 100 women. The electrocution of Ted Bundy went as scheduled to a carnival-like atmosphere outside the prison. On January the 24th, 1989, Theodore Bundy died around 7.13am as crowds outside cheered his death. 